Thanks, Bill. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, the fact is, is that um, the topic of today is offensive IT, really. Most of the time I do this, I am offensive and people really get angry, so. <laughs> but um, I noticed Bill said he did this triathlon thing. He did, he did it like twice and, or four times, right? So two shorts and two longs, right? I did the swim, that sucked. I did the run and the marathon, that's really bad. And then I rode 100 miles on a bike. I said, I'm never doing this stuff again. So, <laughs> so I, I like the commitment. But um, uh, the, the true problem, so let, I want to take us on a little history tour, if I could, for a couple minutes. Because if you're a CIO today, you probably come on the, on the coattails of somebody who was before you. Because the profession's really only, you know, about 20 years old, really. So we start to talk about what that means. So in 1995, that was the evolution of what was available at the best technology we could provide. And the network was abysmal when you think about it. And you know, you talk about the adoption, that was, that was the gaming console today. Now the, the thing talks to you, you don't even have to touch it, right? So here we go, this was the best browser available. This was the Intel community's best shot at best information delivered to the user on that platform, that platform. And this thing caused Andreessen to create Netscape because this thing stunk, right? So you start thinking about how this all came together. That was the running platform. And actually it was built in 91, delivered in 95, took four years of development cycle to get to a produced product that could actually work, right? You're missing the blue screen there. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's behind it. Yeah. You gotta unpeel it. That was your computer. I mean, I built, that was my computer. I built that by hand. And it cost a fortune. I mean, it, unbelievable how much that cost. It cost like $6,000 to build it. And at that time, that's a, that's a lot larger chunk of my income than it is today. Ha, that's the comms closet. You could not put a wire in there unless you were a network engineer or you had a bunch of them in there. Just remember this. This was not possible, what we're doing today. Plugging it in, driving a circuit to this plug in the wall, for, on the floor of the wall, from the back room, it took an engineer. It took a very high-priced engineer. So this is all driven from a network-centric topology. And look, I'm not claiming that I have the answers to any of the questions that we're chasing today. I, I just don't believe that that's possible. There's so many of them. I, the first thing I'm gonna tell you is that the, at the explosion rate that this is going, so does all of that adoption. None of it's possible without a network. So we better be good at networks. And networks are the connection of people, whether it's digitally or interpersonally, it's about a connection. How about this? Anybody have one of those? <laughs> yes. I mean, that gave it, there's a whole culture about people who can capture the signal right and crack into your modem. That's how easy it was. You could just get the right signal, you could go anywhere. Anyway. There wasn't an Amazon, it had just founded in 95, really the concepts, the framework. There was ne certainly not this. Not there. By the way, uh, in 1990, uh, probably in 99, the, the first public uh, video captures that people could take from a video screen on a uh, like a video recorder and published to the web in some kind of format was available in about 98. But in uh, 2012, we were publishing the entire population of the digital platform daily on this platform. I mean, the, the total volume of data available was being published every 48 days. It was doubling in this space, pretty amazing. 1996, technically, the CIO position was created. The term was coined in 1985 by some scientists that thought it was a good idea. Someone adopted it. In 1996, the first positions were created in industry. You saw that. And one of my, uh, my models, my role model, is Don Lepore. Don Lepore was the CIO for Charles Schwab. She took him from uh, brick and mortar into the web. Was the highest compensated uh, CIO in the nation uh, in 1997 or 98. Uh, I think her total net salary was like $28 million. She had earned Charles Schwab $250 million in profit. 1981, Congress established the positions required them by 1998. 
uh, it was it started in 96, but they were required by 98. Most positions were not filled in 98. Uh, the first CIOs were director of IT. This is the problem we're having, I believe. If you were in an IT department and you were the director of IT in 1996 to 98, you were in R&D funding. You, you were not in production funding. There was no money to run a production system. You didn't even have a real true email system until about 1994, 93. You had green screen in 91. You didn't even have a plug and play network until 1990. So you start to think about the time here. So all of a sudden we got all this cost that's being pushed in R&D, developed and now business saying, hey, I could use that. So now we gotta figure out how to make it happen. That's R&D. It's investment in the business. So we take these guys in the, the back department. They're network engineers, they're software engineers, they're guys that are trying to figure out this new technology and we put them into a management position and they fail at a very predictable rate of about every 18 months. Why is 18 months important? You hire somebody, you put them in the job and you say, gosh, and 12 months later you're going, this ain't cutting it. And it takes six months to get rid of them. So that's about the rotation. <laughs> See, the, the CIO is bad on the first day. It just took that long to get the process going over and over again. The ten years now, smartly, are moving out. There are about eight or ten years, really. Seven, I mean, we just went past seven as the average CIO tenure. So we're just about to break the eight-year mark. And I believe it's because we started an education track in 2000 that created a discipline around the structure of what the CIO is supposed to do. Now look, if you're all CIOs in this room, you probably have an idea what you do, but your boss doesn't. He doesn't have a clue. If you ask him what does the COO do, he knows exactly what they do. If you ask him what the CFO does, they know exactly what they do. They have no clue what we do. Part of it is because we don't know what we do. <laughs> At least it's not codified. Do you guys have the book? The CIO book? Do you have the PMBOK for CIOs? I don't have one. Do you have the gap accounting rules for the CIO function? Nope. Are you a CPA certified process? No, we're not. We don't have that. So consequently, we're out there, and we've only been around 19 years, and we're competing <clears throat> against people who are doing this job for 50 years, in the case of COOs and quality management producers. Since the day of the abacus with the CFO, and those buggers have all the control, and we're sitting there trying to compete with them on a one-to-one -one basis, and it's not effective. And it can, you can see it in the structure of the organizations, how CIOs are structured. You usually get an EVP who might be the CFO. Very seldom is a CIO ever an EVP. They're not, they're not treated at the same level. So what, how do we fix the problem? Um, one, one other problem is I think that's what affects the number of women in the field. We hear this crazy thing that we don't have enough women in the field. And in fact, that's probably true. I don't know why we're not generating them enough, but I can tell you this. I know some of the sociological reasons that caused this problem to happen at the CIO level. I'll tell you a story. I, can, I will do this. I can advertise for a nuclear engineer to come run a plant and put that advertisement on the, on the table that has, this, has a, the Umpty Frump certification. I will get hundreds of resumes to run program management support to nuclear engineering. And you know, I would get a resume from a guy who's a friggin' janitor all the way to uh, a, an engine, you know, to maybe an engine repair guy to uh, an executive in a company will apply for that job. But if the woman hasn't taken the certified class and isn't got a background directly in that, they're not gonna apply. So look, if you have girls in school right now and, and they tell you that they don't have the class to go to school, you tell them to apply for it anyway, take the job and go do it. Guys will take a lot more risk than the women will. Now, I speak from a little bit of experience. I have 68% of my staff are women. My senior directors, I have four women out of six. So you think about how weird this is for me. I'm like, oh, this, I came out of the army. You know, there's not a, lot of, not a lot of ladies running down in the dirt with me in the beginning, and it took a long growth period. But, that problem, the problem where women think they have to have the certified skill, they have had to take in the class before they apply, we gotta break that model. So if you don't take anything out of today, go home and break that model if you have girls in school. Because my granddaughters aren't gonna live this way. 
I'll tell you that. We're going to make them offensive people in the IT space, one way or another. So this is the stuff we're supposed to do. Now, does anybody here think they got all that? I don't. I certainly don't have it now, and I've been doing this a long time. I've got capability in each one, but expertise, I would tell you, I don't own the whole circle. You know, what I do have control over and what I do know and where I have focus is specifically in that area, process improvement, capital planning investment, strategic planning, performance-based results, and technology assessment. That's what we do. That's what I do every day. I also lead the team that delivers the services for the rest of the circle. And because of the horizontal aspect of what the, uh, the IT department has across the business, we enjoy a right and a privilege to see things that most people don't get to see in an experience base that's much broader. If we can capture it, leverage it, our compatriots in the other disciplines will understand why we're valuable. They want us to be a catalyst, make the changes. They want to make sure we do the OCM plan, right? Right. The comm plan, the cultural conversion, and the conversion of every person into a disciple of IT in support of the business. Not possible, we just can't run all this. These are functions that we actually serve as a, as a center point for, but not necessarily have to run by ourselves. The key job that we have is painting a picture, a clear technology path to the future. If we can't do that, if you as a CIO are not painting that picture, I think you haven't really captured the requirement of what the CIO role is. It's not to run the IT. I don't run IT. I mean, I manage the budget, I oversee the execution, I make sure the deliverables, the outcomes are achieved, yada, yada, yada. But I'm not putting the servers in the rack. I'm not writing the code. I'm managing a solution at the enterprise level that other people don't seem to, one, know how to do, and certainly nobody wants to do this job because no one's asked for my job lately. I am responsible for the total investment in IT, whether I spend it or not. Okay, so if you take that concept, you got shadow IT, you got sub-development IT, you got business unit element IT, I account for it all. I give the unit, I give the, a very predictable number for the second or third largest investment in the corporation to the leadership team to make better decisions with. In a nutshell, that's the master's level program of the specialized skill that the CIO provides to the business. I just see this, for some reason, I have this clarity that I think I'm supposed to know, and this is how I talk to my boss. He, he doesn't always like it, but... The other thing is, I'm only, there are only three people who signed a SOX statement for a publicly traded company. The CFO signs it, the CEO signs it, and the CIO signs it to make sure they say the systems are secure. Nobody else signs that document. So it's actually a reportable officer, although most of them are not in the, in the, in the system. So I want to do a little diatribe here because this really irritates the crap out of me since I figured I'd start this off right. This chief digital, chief knowledge, all this chief other stuff, that's a waste of energy in a company. Go tell your CEOs this, this is not a good idea. Because most of the time, how does it happen? Let's, talk, let's be honest. You want, to be the, you want to be the effective support to the business? Do the job. That's the first thing. Second part is this. They appoint a chief digital officer. Most of the time, the CEO has been to a conference, comes back, says, hey, I think I need to appoint a chief digital officer. So they're going to hire this guy. He's going to show up. He's got to hire him an assistant, so he's going to have a, someone to sit there. And then he's, maybe he'll have a, another person helps him craft digital data and information. And the next thing you know, they're coming for the budget. What, who's paying that bill? It's not coming out of the CEO's budget. I can guarantee you that. It's coming out of the IT budget. So you've got now your IT staff is trying to answer five masters as opposed to the one that should be driving the consolidated vision. So the resources are limited. You, you don't want multiple people, but it also introduces tremendous risk because there's a non-compliance concept when these guys come in. They'll come in and go, we should be able to do this. They do it on Facebook. Well, this isn't Facebook, folks. I'm in a federally regulated business that has rules, compliance, and structure. So how do you want to do this if you have more chiefs than you have people doing the work? It moves the technology decisions outside the realm of the CIO, and that's the biggest problem. Because if the CISO reports to the CIO, it's also going outside of his realm, and that's where it really gets to be a problem. 
So what do we do? We have to stop being the order taker. We have to, have to, we have to become a value creator. Um, just last week, we ha I just did my budget for next year, which is a painful exercise. Um, so I sit down with some of the, dire the directors and the, and the lead developers. They say, okay, what are you doing? Well, we, you know, well, how much is it going to cost? I don't know because we haven't got all the requirements. You probably all hear this from your teams. We haven't got all the requirements from the business. Well, who in the business do you need the requirements from? Well, you know, the guys that are going to use the data. Well, who are those? Well, we haven't found them yet. I'm like, do you think that somebody is going to miraculously describe your IT technical requirement for a budget in a way that you're going to be able to precisely get to it? How about you do the other thing? You're the IT pro. Why don't you go talk to the business, ask him what he needs, and then tell him how technology can make his job better and help him define the requirement. So in my case, that's action-oriented IT. It delivers a solution, and it helps people find out what they're doing. The key thing in, the, in my IT department was when I first got here, everything was a project. And if there was no money in the budget, you couldn't do any more projects. So they were always the department of no. Nope, don't have the money. The other thing they would do is they would truncate services as the budget was reduced. So we tried to change the, the mantra, like, this is what we're going to deliver for services. And the speed with which we do it, we're going to keep at a constant rate. And all the unnecessary stuff will be the stuff that pays the budget challenges. And we became a department of how, not the department of no. And uh, it actually transitioned the whole corporation fairly quickly. A uh, little uh, side note, I was brought to SAIC to actually break out and lead the company separation from the split. You know, we were old SAIC, split into Lidos and SAIC. So now that's how I got the job, and now I can't get out of the job. So it's kind of weird. Proactive, that's that concept of the requirements generation. If, if you go ask the business, say, what do you need? And they, the, generally they say, I mean, I've had brown bag lunches. I've had sit downs with leaders. No, I really don't need any IT. I'm good. And then you go back, you build your budget without their IT request. And what happens the day after the budget's approved? Can you give me this? Can you give me that? Like, where were you like six months ago? So that's the challenge that you face in the IT world. Plus, they're reading the same magazines that everybody else does in the airplane, thinking, hey, that's a great idea. We ought to do that. Well, great ideas without precision, without planning, become very costly mistakes a lot of times. So I was listening to the stories about how you interact with the business. So I think. Um, I think what we really should talk about is what do we need to do to standardize, codify, and structure what it means to be a CIO in a business. And it doesn't matter whether it's an association business, a for-profit, a not-for-profit, or uh, a government position. They all have to have some common things. So in, in uh, SAIC, we actually operate from an asset-centric management strategy driven to financial precision. That's a, our plan. I won't invest if you can't tell me how many things we got. If you can't tell me how many things we got, you don't know how much it's going to cost. Consequently, I have no financial acumen to be able to deliver to the CFO. Now, it's nice to be heroes because we save lots of money for the CFO. But in the four years I've been there, we've accomplished about $42 million in cost reduction and takeout based on the infrastructure reductions that are necessary to run today's business. So it's interesting because we were a $10 billion business. Now we're a $5 billion business. And trying to, you ought to try and pair out one of those fat servers and, and service systems that you have with the storage and the servers and all the networking gear. It's almost impossible. So you've got to be creative. You've got to reduce staff. You've got to reduce structure. You've got to reduce things. Um, integrated asset management. This is the key. The, now, this capital planning investment control process, we talked about reviewing. You, you, heard, uh, you heard the discussion about how do you look at the system and do you review it? Do you go back and look at it? The capital planning investment control system actually talks about that. And this is a the government style training. The federal CIO certificate trains you how to do CPIC. I would advise you, if you've got a chance, go review a CPIC process. You could do a $100 million investment today, 24 to 36 months later, you look at it to see if you got the return. Is it performing the way it's supposed to? And it helps you make the next generation decision. So we do this as a matter of record for 148 systems. Requirements management, I already talked about. The prioritization of the candidate investment. So I'll talk to you a little bit about this real quick. 
I don't own the authority. I own the authority to make the technologies decision. I don't own the authority to tell you all the time what I'm going to spend the money on. So I could, but it's very, you end up in that we don't trust IT kind of problem. So the way we do it is we gather all the requirements. We bring in intermediate business leaders to prioritize one to end what they think the priorities should be and which ones we should do next. Then I take it to a combined board of the finance guys, the ops guys, and I have them hash out how much they want to spend next year. And from that dollar, we run down the list and, cut and put the cut line in. And that is the project list for next year. So in that way, I actually involve the business in the very decision that they tell us that they're not involved in. And, and it becomes, it's very beneficial for me. I have to be an expert at the financial budgetary, not my process, the company's process. You have to be an expert at the company process. I'm the largest budget combined in the thing after human capital. When we pay the bills for the labor, my budget exceeds all the functional staff combined if you take rent out. So when I make a mistake, when I make a $5 million mistake, it's two cents off the share price. When I make a $10 million, it's, it's, it's five cents off the share price. So precision, understanding what you affect in the budgetary process, how that affects the organization's operational budget, what systems get, have to stop, what things have to no, no longer be invested in because you've made mistakes, becomes a very real tangible connection between what the CIO does every day and how the business runs. And that's the value prop that we provide to them. This one's one, if you want to save money, invest in a vendor management, uh, license management expert. Just buy one. They're expensive, but they'll save you 10x their cost. And risk management, I'm responsible for that in a big way. And, and you know, when you go to the risk register for SEIC, of the 13 risks that are listed, nine are mine, almost always in the cyberspace. So I believe that if we're as CIOs want to make a difference in the future of this profession, we have to lead what it's going to be. If we do not do this, the business will do it for us. And lo and behold, we're not going to be happy with what they come up with. We haven't been in the past. We're not going to be in the future. All right, so that's, that's kind of where we, that's how I see what I consider to be offensive IT leadership driving a business solution and changing the way we operate IT in the future and, and tomorrow. And I think it provides a foundation for the people behind us to follow in a way that's orchestrated, structured, and repeatable. Final note, if you go to a company today, if I go in any one of your associations or I go into a profit company and I say, all right, let me see the book and I'm the CFO, I, probably, I bet in an hour I could figure it out. It doesn't matter what company you're in. It doesn't matter what you do. In an hour, I could look at the general register, or general register, the accounts receivable, the accounts payable, and the transaction rates of the business, have a pretty good idea what, even what size the, the ERP to run that has to be. And, and an hour ago, I think I'm, I'm not gonna take that job, right, in an hour. I bet in three hours I could take a COO function, look at the program management skills, the integrated master schedule, the development of people, the number of PMs online, number of red, yellow, and green programs, and I could walk away and say, I think this is a good risk for me to operate in this company or not. CEOs, same kind of structure. What do you look at in the CIO's office? I, I'm serious. You're going to come to me and you want to be the CIO at SAIC. What are you going to ask me? The first thing you want to ask me. Usually it's how much budget they give you and where's the restroom. <laughs> well, restroom's down there and they don't give me enough budget. What do you want to know? How many systems are you supporting? Who are the people? What's the structure? How, what is your transaction rate? What's your success rate? What's the age of your capital plan? How many rotations do you have to do to get something approved? And, you know, if we don't get that kind of standardization from one CIO office to another, we're not repeatable functions. We're not transportable either. You can't jump into my office and I can't jump into yours. So I can tell you that my focus has been, I built the CIO function for Army Intelligence Security Command in 2000. 
to 2005. I was hired by BAE to build it for them. I was good friends with the CIO for SAIC, had worked on a lot of projects, and when I walked in, I thought, man, this is gonna be easy. I'll just fall into what he was doing. Only to go, where is everything? Where's the capital plan? Where's the asset management structure? So what I'm learning and have learned, and frankly, I try to teach, is that these are core components of CIO discipline that we as a, as a profession have got to insist that our educational system starts to produce training for to get the results that we expect to do. I know that's a lot of preachy stuff. Uh, he asked, uh, Bill asked me to talk about action-oriented uh, CIO stuff. I think we do action-oriented IT for the business in uh, SAIC, but I, would, I just wanted to share some of my observations and experiences about what we're looking at when I look at the profession, its development and its growth over time. So thanks. Any questions? Sure. So uh, you, you mentioned that uh, you bring in the, uh, some of the managers to discuss you know, how things are going to be for next year and, and all of that. And we also know that anyone that goes to the bathroom with PC Magazine, they come out an expert <laughs> yeah. in, in IT and now know what's best and, and know that this technology is the thing we need to use and so on. And also, uh, you know that before you can do a project here, there are some things you need to do beforehand in order to get there. Upgrade this other system, eliminate these other things, convert some database, whatever. How do you, uh, how do you sort of tell people to swim in their own lane? Because fairly often you get other experts, from the legal guy to the guy that works in the mailroom that comes in to tell you that this is the way we need to approach this or, or bug you about it. Yes. Day, uh, so that's a great question. And, and it's driven down to a financial discipline practice called business case development. They, you know, if they're going to do a business investment, they have to do a business case. If they're going to do an IT investment in SEIC, they have to present the business case. Now, I do have a rogue development going on right now called micro, micro strategy training. So they're going to take training, split it apart into small modules. They're going to put it on the web, deliver it to mobile. And I'm like, okay, what's the infrastructure? How many servers? What's, where are you going to put it? How much is it going to cost? And they don't have the answers because they're in the prototype space. They're not into the service delivery space. So I had to actually go, and it's, I don't usually do it too often, but I said, you're not connecting to the system until you fix this. Because you know, they said, well, it's going to cost 10 bucks in Amazon. I said, $10 to train 15,000 people. Uh, are you guys, what are you smoking over there? You, you gotta, let's get realistic here. I mean, <laughs> we're talking $500,000 on, on Amazon's bill alone for $15,000. 15,000 people trained with video, interactive. Do you know what the server load's gonna be for that? No, it's, it's, we just use the AWS and charge it on the credit card. So we can download it from whatever. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's you know, you have to put reality into their, into their view of what's going on. I mean, it's a perfect example. And we just had five meetings on it. And my team is also, you gotta stop them. I said, no, we have to figure out what they need to tell us so we can make them effective, but not stopping them. Stopping's not the answer. So, you talked about innovation. How, how does your mind relate to innovation as a CIO? Because you had a very different approach to how you approach innovation at SAIC because you're delivering these services back to government entities but, and they're expecting you to be cutting edge, right? How do you sure. They're, they're not actually expecting cutting edge. They're, okay. they're expecting a financial model supportable and sustainable to run their business. Remember that. That's the first important thing. Cutting edge costs a fortune. The, you know, the bleeding edge, you know, state of the art. There is no state of the art in everything I deliver. I, it had better be repeatable or it's not going in the infrastructure. Brings me back to another point, Bill, I, I forgot to talk about this, is we're not good at what we own. We suck at what we own. We will buy new stuff just for the sake of buying it because it seems to be easier than fixing what we should know how to do. I, I, that is so frustrating to me. We have thrown away more stuff that's valuable in the IT profession than we've created, in, in my opinion. You know, fundamentals like real good Active Directory management with IDM integrated with good authentication structures that are clean, structured, and, and nice are really, really important skills that we have to spend some money on. And we've got to invest in our people to be able to do it. Or else, 
Everything else falls apart. You've got to be really good at the network. If you are not good at the network, your best application won't run. So be really good at those fundamentals. Get a foundation and then create a, a, a foundation that people can actually spring off of, not crawl off of, so to speak. So that's kind of how I see that picture. Um, innovation is another thing. It's about people. And, and if you want people to do something better and different tomorrow, go look at what they're doing and then see if there's a technology that will make a difference. Don't give them a technology and expect them to do something better if the technology doesn't make that happen. You've got to get that, that mantra into making people effective. You want a good example of something that doesn't work? We, we, we are responsible for this thing, and I hate it. Look at the PKI system. Public key infrastructure certifications for encryption, decryption, and securing mail. It is so bad, people avoid using it. And if one person avoids using it, the solution stinks. And right now, it's, it's broke. How many people have tokens to get into the VPN network without, for multi-factor authentication? That's a broken process. We, as IT guys, ought to go home and clean up the back shop, make things seamlessly better for everybody who wants to touch the system, or we're kidding ourselves. That's what we're paid to do, by the way, is fix the problem, not create new ones. PKI is a problem every day. We made it so hard, people can't even understand what the hell it is. So consequently, it doesn't work. Then we wonder why it's not working right. I, I, to me, those are just root cause analysis kind of functions. So anyway, a couple of thoughts. Yeah, go ahead. One more. Uh, didn't, I noticed you didn't talk much about compliance. And uh, we've got, in our industry, a uh, NIST uh, being pushed on that needs to be done by the end of the year. Uh, what's your Do you favorite? swallow that whole thing, right? <laughs> yeah. He's pretending to. Uh, what's, uh, what's your take on that, and, and how do you uh, yeah. connect innovation and, and what you just finished saying about uh, the broken processes to actually be able to also comply? So politically, you know, you, you kind of have to support it. You don't have a choice because you'll be out. You won't be bidding. Right. So you got to do it. So what my my uh, general counsel said this. He said, you know, compliance is binary. It's yes or it's no. Uh, com uh, actually operating efficiently and effectively, those are kind of gray. So, I, you know, I, I don't know if I have the true answer, but this is right. The way they implemented it, you can't understand it. So it's not in plain language, which means we're all killed. We're going to kill ourselves trying to figure it out. And then we're going to go for 50 interpretation levels about what the heck it means, right? So that's a good indication that your product get interpreted the one way that you, that you had it. Yeah, so the NIST, FISMA, uh, the, the NIST framework that we have to comply with in the DFAR, by the way, is pretty interesting. We went to an industry day two weeks ago, and this is what they told us. Who's going to inspect it? Is someone from NIST going to tell us that we're compliant with their framework? No, no. The KO, the PM, and the TM in the contract that's bidding is going to tell you whether you're compliant with the framework. I'm like... <laughs> They can't even explain the framework, so they're going to tell me that I'm compliant or not compliant. So this is really complicated. Now, we've been, I've been engaged at all levels of the industry agencies that are trying to influence the policies in the government. And, you know, we've got our legislative liaison guys driving through us. We're trying to get some clear answers so we can comply. And it's tough, especially when compliance is not a firm thing to be able to stand on. It's you, know, you have to be compliant. We, we know what we think it's going to be only to have somebody who doesn't know what compliance is to inspect us to tell us we're not compliant. That's a many-to-many -many problem that I don't think is solvable at this rate. So it'll go through a couple court iterations, and eventually it will come standardized. So how are we doing? Oh, we got 10 minutes, eight minutes. So good. Anything else? Yep. I just have a general question. You have been in the industry for a long time and in your current role. Um, what do you love about it? What do I love about this role? I love looking in the mirror every day and saying to myself, did I make it a little better for the guys in the, in the business? And I, uh, more often than not, I say yes. And as things start to change, as, as compliance and, in, and rules and everything, if it starts to go to the left side where I don't think I've made enough of an uh, impact, I'm going to go do something else. I do worry about one thing. I worry, do I have the mental capacity to operate in the virtual world structures that were driving all of the business applications and systems. I worry about this a lot. 
I, you know, I could talk to my VM guy and I'll be asleep in two seconds. I have no idea what the hell he's talking about, where he's going. But here's a kid who's 24 years old running 8,000 servers by himself, which would take a staff of four, five, 600 people to do previously poorly. And he's, done, he's doing it very efficiently, very standardized. It's a new, it's a new mental thinking. And, and despite my best training, I mean, I train on this thing. I mean, I, I spend energy taking online classes and stuff. I don't have the answers for that. I, my brain does not, I can do 100 servers in the virtual world. I can manage them. Once I get past that, I can't remember what's connected to where, what's the protocol or all that stuff. So I worry that, you know, maybe I'm getting too old, really. Uh, the mental capacity might not be there, the, the synapse connection that I need to really run at that efficiency level. So maybe it's time to make space for the next generation, which I also challenge you to do. Start training them because look around this room. We're not exactly young chickens. <laughs> and eventually someone's going to have to replace us. So let's put the best qualified people in there to do that and let's get them growing now. You know, this is really a problem. We, all us old guys are standing in the way of these millennials that want to run our show. That's my favorite interview question, by the way. Where do you see yourself in five years? Well, I think I'd like to be the CIO. And I ask him, well, what would you have me do? <laughs> hey, thank you very much. That was great. Okay, so that was we've great. Um, five minutes left. Do we have anybody have questions for Mr. Bosch or Bob um, as we <clears throat> wrap up? Just a quick question. Are you going to make some of these presentations or all of them available? Uh, as long as they, uh, uh, yes to mine, as long as they, they're okay with it. I will, but I have to get there. there. Yeah, okay. Mine's fine. Yours fine? Uh, mine, as long as you don't share it outside of us. I, I don't have a problem with the content because the content's out published, but don't share my opinions without at least calling me and say, look, hey, you know, I want to put this down someplace. Because if it gets written, it's the Technology Business Management Council's answer to the ERP solution for the CIO. It's about IT tracking. So the Aptio software, now look, this is a little incestuous. Uh, Aptio created the Technology Business Management Council to validate that their software is going to work. But, and do the right stuff. What they're doing is they're using a council of cross CIOs to gather the challenges that CIOs operate on and they're codifying it in software and then they're selling a commercial product. Uh, the term conflict of interest kind of come in there a little bit, you know. So anyway, uh, if you're a woman that wants to guide the future, they're looking for women to serve on the Aptio board. That I would re highly recommend that you think about doing that if you're interested in growing the future of the profession. It's really a good opportunity to get what your ideas are codified in a technical solution that people implement. Aptio is in the State Department, GAO, OPM. Uh, it's going to go to the Department of Defense fairly quickly. And then all these agencies are going to need experts at how to do it. And it's interesting. My business sells IT services integration to the federal government. And the experts for Aptio in my business are my team, which are all indirect which they have to contract to send into the government, which is kind of cool. I, the one, one note is uh, when I first took this job, the CEO yeah, told me, I, I do, yeah, he told me I'm not allowed to run a P&L in the IT shop because <laughs> it messes up the business model of the organization. So, but that's the technology, Aptio software, pretty cool stuff, helps you codify and manage the towers and the structures and gives you some foundations on how to account for technology investments in, at the enterprise level, not the system level, the enterprise level. Okay, so in, in it's a maturity. You grow early through maturity through like five layers and you'll eventually get to a totally integrated solution. But I, I would recommend you take a look at it.